Alessandra, why don't you give us um, a, a quick overview of the work yes. you're doing and how it connects right. to this debate? Pleasure. Actually, it connects a little bit. Uh, connects. Thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me and giving you the chance to describe a little bit of my research at Imperial. And uh, what I'm going to talk about links uh, in particular with some of the last questions, you know, which is how descriptive these models are. You know, how can we trust uh, what the machine learning is actually learned. And the other question we had, what's the difference between machine learning and AI, all right? So maybe I'm going to put a couple of slides there to just uh, highlight a little bit and address some of these questions, uh, and at the same time talk about what I do, or what my research group does at Imperial, okay? So the emphasis in our work is really, is on particular type of machine learning technology, which is called logic-based machine learning. And uh, why do we want to do logic-based machine learning? So because we really learn into or believe into the ability of learning, extract knowledge from data and the ability of be able to evolve this knowledge over time. So by taking advantage of the feedback loop that added environment of the user or whatever are giving back to the machine, to the system, okay? So I'm going to briefly to touch about this stuff. So people talk about the knowledge acquisition from large data, from big data, okay? So in general, you will think in this, this problem is divided into three big uh, you know, steps, to, you know, milestones, right? There's a big problem about what is the data acquisitions? You know, how do we clean the data and so on, okay? There's a big problem about how do we identify the key features that I want to extract from the data? And then, of course, at the end, what is the true knowledge which is behind this data, okay? So symbolic machine learning or logic-based machine learning is actually concentrated on the, this part of the entire process, okay? So we're not really looking at what are the features, you know, we're looking at, okay, there's uh, some pre-processing of this data, but we are more interested in how can we understand this high-level concept and knowledge semantically that is hidden in the data in such a way that we can actually explain back to the, to the user that is actually using those systems. And this kind of a process allows the user to gain a further trust in the decisions on the prediction that the system makes. All right, so and that's really what we are working on on that particular part. So really, this is the part of the slide which maybe clarify a little bit the part of you know what is AI or what is machine learning. AI is a very broad area, and uh, one aspect of research in, in the international you know different uh, community and two big uh, sub areas of uh, artificial intelligence are actually machine learning and knowledge representation. So how can I model the semantics of my you know, problem domain, okay? What are the mechanisms for representing this, this knowledge, okay? So the symbolic machine learning is actually sitting in the middle between the two. So our algorithms and system that are can allow you to do the prediction, but the model that you're learning are descriptive, declarative, all right? So they can be expressed back into natural language to the user itself to say exactly what has been learned. All right, and they use that kind of feedback. So really, these are actually also the other in interesting bit is that they are general purpose algorithms. So they are no algorithms. So I think David asked a question before. If I have a new set of data, will I have to start from scratch? Will I have to relearn again? So because of their general purpose algorithm, they are symbolic and they work on the semantics, uh, you will never need it to start from scratch. So they give you the possibility of making inference on what is wrong on the model and what are the minimal changes that I can make it in the model in order to accommodate or explain the new evidence that I have of the particular problem domain, okay? So they have their general purpose algorithms and you can, they give you the ability to learn from large data but as well as from little data. One of the problem in deep, for instance, in deep learning is unless you have a huge amount of data, you really don't make any sense of it, all right? So the algorithm is such that they need the quantity. And they are very good at it. I'm not saying that they are not, they are actually excellent. But sometimes it's in the outlayer. So in the, in the exceptions that the problem is. So if I have an, a, you know, a self-driving car, all right? So I can have, I can approximate some of the machine learning processes for doing that, but there are some unpredicted situations, which are the outlayer, where the algorithm will actually fail. Right? So can I learn from these few examples? So can I revise the model from these few examples? So this is a one of the big features of symbolic machine learning. Okay? And we have done large contributions in this field, in particular in the last 15 years, uh, from both a theoretical and an implementation point of view. We, are, we have systems that can be now deployed into different application domains. So what kind of little just 
just idea of the little problems that we attack with is a very simple one, okay, just intuitions. Uh, one is actually in the context of learning human behavior, all right? So if we have the ability of learning sort of a policy or models or descriptive models that we can express back, one the possibility could be in self-adaptive systems. So I can take a mobile system that is actually able to adapt itself to different contexts, but actually report back what are the adaptive policy and the strategy that the system has learned. So and this is integrations of different types of sensors uh, put together. And uh, you can think of uh, uh, learning uh, uh, sort of some kind of self-adaptive uh, policies that they are executed into the system. And you can report that back uh, only when you, the system has set a level of uncertainty to the user. And the user can give you immediately the feedback. And the feedback can be used to refine what has been learned. Right, so it is a process really here of iterative continuous learning. All right. Uh, so another type of application we touched on is in the context of learning uh, uh, human behavior and human preferences in the urban mobility uh, domain. So uh, we worked in an European project where actually uh, people are moving around the city, and we do know that we go on the Google you know, map and we say, I want to go from A to B, and they give you the best route for that, right? But the choice of the best route is based on predefined preferences, criteria, maybe the shortest path, maybe the less number of changes, or and so on, right? So here in this case is an intelligent system that actually learns the preferences that the human has in their mind when it makes a certain choices. So given a certain kind of a, a possibility of mobility from A to B, and then the, the human decides it, based on these choices, the system learned what are the preferences the human had in their head when they actually made the choices, okay? So this is really a human personalized assistant in the true sense. All right? It's not personalized based on the huge quantity of data of how many people normally and how do they move, but it's personalized how on, on what I do, on what I, you know, the way that I move in a city. And this becomes the scripting model that embedded in certain smart system or cognitive or personal assistant systems, you can take it with you wherever you are. All right? So you can imagine you can feed the data from the particular location where you are, apply the model about your preferences, and then the system will provide your suggested route which will satisfy the particular type of preferences you have in your, when you move around in a city. All right? so, uh, so this is, was a quite a successful um, type of application that we did, and we worked with the various uh, you know, universities and the research institute and company in Europe. And so really this is just a, some very simple examples you know, I don't want, to, for instance, to go through area in a city which are highly high crime rate. Or given my particular preferences, I never walk, walk in the park, let's say, very late at night or things like that. So there are many criteria, and these criteria can be learned. So automatically and also ranked in a certain way, all right? So that a certain choices are done to satisfy certain criteria, and then if there are alternatives, you move on and you try to satisfy other criteria and so on. So that's really how these models work. All right, when you actually deploy them. Okay, um, so um, the interesting bit, so this is adjusted to tell a little bit more. Why I put this slide up is because how do we verify that what we have learned is correct? All right, so uh, really, this is typical problem in machine learning. There are very many tests, statistical tests you can do. One of the standard one is accuracy, is cross validation. So, so you try and you see, okay, I've, I've covered, I've come up with this model which covered these examples. So these are unseen, does it predict correctly, okay? And the interesting bit here is that we actually are able to converge to whatever where the model of the human had in the head, because we worked with people in, the in Trento, in Italy, uh, we managed to converge to their preferences in less than just eight examples. So we didn't need many, all right? With eight examples, we had over 80% of accuracy, all right? And the similar things, so, so the, this is a really powerful system so because of the reason and the work on the semantics rather than the, the, so the quantity and the, the uh, you know, quantitative valuations of weights of these uh, uh, features, okay? So where does this take us? You know, why would you want to do that, all right? So I put this up because I think it's quite an interesting uh, area which I'm currently working on, and it is uh, the area about uh, 
cognitive empowerment, right? I take a lot of the comments here which were very good. We, are not, we don't want to replace humans, right? I come from that angle, right? I love to work with people, so I don't want to replace. I don't want to, do a, to build a system which is so intelligent that I don't need the humans anymore, right? For certain things, it's okay, but for others, uh, where there are really serious decisions, uh, it's important interactions with humans, right? So really what we want to do here is building cognitive systems uh, that they are able to support the humans in their task, all right? And how they can make, become smart to be able to do that is through this machine learning or symbolic or integrations of machine learning statistica and the symbolic logic-based machine learning, okay? So if we think from the point of view of training, uh, the standard of process, you have normally the normal data, the amount of data. This can be, I don't know, IBM talks about text data, right? They're so good in processing natural language now, right? You have to give a huge quantity of text and they make sense of the way, right? So they're just, in these directions, you have the data and the knowledge, and then you do the information instructions and you, do, you build your knowledge, and that's it. So you have trained the machine. Right? So at this point, you have your smart machine there that you can actually deploy. Right? But this machine is as good as, and I think David was referring a little bit to that, as good as to how good the data are in input. Right? So how good is the feedback the user has done in the training process? All right? But if the data later on change, or if uh, you know, there are some kind of diversion in bias, as you're saying, there is a problem currently, for instance, some of the machines, such as even the Watson in IBM, on having to retrain these machines. Right? And the time spent in retraining that is really among us. Right? So, we, so this is a really, it's almost like feeling like there is no business case, but actually there is a business case. And what David was actually referring to, what I'm referring as well, is the fact of can I actually learn, can I actually have uh, some processes here that allow me to, based on what I know and the feedback I have, to go back and relearn, you know, relearn, adjust, revise what I have learned. So in David was referring to correcting the bias, all right? So in, in our case, it's uh, augmenting and revising the knowledge that the system has. So this is really important because here we are in this continuous machine learning environment, right? The sort of context rather than a one-step process of deployment. Alessandra. So, and with that, I'll Thank just stop. You.